The end of the Cold War came as a complete surprise to all analysts, Soviet, American, European, no one predicted it. The sudden geopolitical shift was a product of several factors that all coalesced into the collapse of the Soviet and communist systems in Eastern Europe while still managing to survive and adapt to the new world order in China, Vietnam, and Cuba. When asked about his approach to the Soviet Union, Reagan had a simple philosophy, quote, we win, they lose. While that was meant to be a joke, this was exactly what happened. The first factor that contributed to the end of the Cold War was economic. When Reagan came to office, he was convinced of the strength and endurance of the American political and economic system, but also the inherent weakness of the Soviet system. Throughout the Cold War, the Soviets and Americans had engaged in an extraordinarily expensive arms race, and so Reagan opted to double down and invest so heavily in defense spending that the Soviets would not be able to keep up. This strategy, known as peace through strength, was wildly popular and played a significant role in the disintegration of the Soviet Union. As a Soviet official reluctantly acknowledged, quote, our economy had been literally eviscerated by military spending, end quote. In order to achieve Reagan's objective, he vastly increased defense spending to levels unheard of since the Second World War. For example, throughout the 1980s, the Reagan administration spent a whopping $2 trillion on a peacetime defense buildup. Reagan's expansion involved large investment in the B-1 bomber, the stockpiling of nuclear weapons, the expansion of the Navy, the buildup of counterinsurgency forces, and the development of advanced weapon systems like the stealth bomber, cruise missiles, and the Trident II nuclear submarine. In addition, the Pentagon's operational budget doubled from $143.9 billion in 1980 to $294.7 billion in 1985, even though the U.S. was not engaged in war. The American buildup was so vast that prominent American foreign policy veterans like George Kennan called on Reagan to, quote, cease this madness, end quote, and on other superpowers to cut their nuclear stockpiles by 50%. However, Reagan's most controversial move was his support for the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, which sought to develop a space-based weapons system capable of shooting down intercontinental ballistic missiles in mid-flight. Often referred to as Star Wars, if the FDI was successful at blocking Soviet ICBMs, it had the potential to disrupt the long-standing Soviet and American policy of mutually assured destruction, also known as MAD. Moreover, this would tilt the nuclear balance of power decidedly in the favor of the Americans. Moscow was terrified. Interestingly, when Reagan announced his support for SDI, he failed to consult his secretaries of defense and state, who were shocked that he would reveal a program that was only in its infancy, one so half-baked that Secretary of State George Shultz described it as lunacy. Cracks in the Soviet-led Warsaw Pact, which was composed of all Eastern European communist states in the Soviet Union, first began to appear in Poland in 1981 with the rise of the Solid labor movement, which had held strikes throughout the country in opposition to the communist regime in power. In December 1981, Brezhnev ordered the Polish military to crack down on the movement, leading Reagan to suspend economic agreements with Poland, reduce Soviet-American trade, and ban Soviet flights to the U.S. American-Soviet relations were further soured in September 1983 when Soviet pilots shot down a Korean air flight from Anchorage to Seoul, South Korea, killing everyone on board. Soviet officials claimed the flight had strayed into Soviet airspace. However, subsequent investigations showed that the plane was in international airspace at the time of the incident. Reagan lashed out against the Soviets, calling the episode a barbarous act and urging allies to suspend flights to the Soviet Union. The situation then escalated in September 1983, when a Soviet monitoring system reported that a single nuclear-armed missile had been launched towards the Soviet Union. However, the Soviet technician monitoring the launch, Stanislav Petrov, pulled the world back from the brink of annihilation when he correctly determined that an American attack would have involved hundreds of missiles, not a single one. Next to the Cuban Missile Crisis, the closest the world came to a nuclear war occurred in November 1983, when NATO carried out a planned military exercise named Able Archer, which for the first time incorporated realistic elements of warfare like radio silence, a new code system, and the involvement of heads of government. The Soviets concluded that this was no ordinary drill, but a ruse in preparation for an actual attack. The Kremlin then raised its threat level and placed Polish and East German forces on alert. The attack never came. As tensions rose, Reagan commenced a campaign aimed at delegitimizing the Soviet system abroad. In 1985, Reagan gave a famous speech where he referred to the Soviet Union as an evil empire, which caused civil wars, undermined democracy, promoted terrorism, and was generally the cause of, quote, all the unrest that was going on in the world, end quote. 
However, Reagan's turn towards harsh rhetoric occurred just at a time when major changes were taking place inside the Soviet Union, ones that would change the face of history. Another major factor that contributed to the end of the Cold War was the aging of the Soviet leadership. At the end of the 1980s, the average age of the Politburo, the Soviet decision-making body, was about 68 years old, up from 55 in 1966. For example, when the Soviet Union's longtime leader, Leonid Brezhnev, died in 1982, he was 76 years old. After his death, Brezhnev was replaced by Yuri Andropov, who died shortly thereafter in 1984, and then Konstantin Chernenko, who died shortly after assuming office. The Soviet leadership finally stabilized under the selection of Mikhail Gorbachev in March 1985, who vowed to transform the nature of the Soviet leadership's relationship with those that it ruled over. At the ripe age of 54, Gorbachev was significantly younger than his predecessors and well aware of the faults of the Kremlin's authoritarian rule. Upon coming to power, Gorbachev announced the implementation of two policies known as glasnost, or openness, which sought to lift censorship, improve public consultation, and bring about an honest discussion about the regime's faults, and perestroika, or restructuring, which sought to end decades of centralized planning that had nearly bankrupt the state-run economic system. Of these, Glasnost arguably contributed more to the collapse of the Soviet Union. By the time Gorbachev came to power in 1985, the Red Army had been waging a war in Afghanistan that it had never actually acknowledged existed, and yet the dead bodies of Russian soldiers were coming home in large numbers. Soldiers fighting the war had been denied combat pay because there was no war, while grieving mothers were denied combat pensions. The introduction of Glasnost, however, meant acknowledging the war and the sacrifices Red Army soldiers had paid, but it also led to criticism of the way the war was being fought. Unused to criticism, Soviet leaders struggled as wave upon wave of stinging critiques were leveled at the regime. Despite the growing hostility between the U.S. and Soviet Union, both sides worked throughout the 1980s to reduce their vast stockpiles of nuclear weapons. In 1982, Soviet and American negotiators met in Geneva and engaged in Strategic Arms Reduction Talks, or START. However, the talks broke down as the American delegation demanded steep reductions in the number of nuclear weapons each side could have. The Soviet delegation argued that this would destroy its deterrence capability. However, the nuclear deadlock broke in April 1986 when a disaster struck at the Chernobyl nuclear power station in Ukraine when a reactor melted down, spewing radiation into the air, after which Gorbachev unilaterally halted deployment of intermediate-range nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons testing. Building on this momentum, Reagan and Gorbachev met in Reykjavik, Iceland in October 1986, where they agreed to reduce the number of nuclear warheads, missiles, long-range bombers, and to remove intermediate-range missiles from Europe. This appeared to be an enormous breakthrough, until Gorbachev added that the U.S. would also have to abandon SDI. Reagan balked. The two met again in Washington in December 1987, where Gorbachev agreed to withdraw the Red Army from Afghanistan, which was completed a year later in early 1989. Before the completion of the withdrawal, Gorbachev announced in December 1988 that the Red Army would unilaterally cut its troop numbers by 500,000 men and send 10,000 tanks to the scrapyard, while quietly letting it be known that the Soviet Union would no longer enforce the Brezhnev Doctrine. The end of the war in Afghanistan and the shift in tenor of U.S.-Soviet relations towards the end of the 1980s brought about a remarkable geopolitical shift throughout 1988 and 1989 that changed world history. The beginning of the end began in May 1988 when Hungary and Austria reached an agreement to reopen their mutual border, which had been closed since the 1960s. That summer, thousands of East Germans flocked to Hungary in unprecedented numbers, only to cross the Austro-Hungarian border and then trek to West Germany, where they were automatically given West German citizenship. The East German authorities responded with a travel ban to Hungary, and this only led citizens to circumvent the policy by a travel to Czechoslovakia and then Hungary. By October 1988, more than 200,000 East German refugees had arrived in the West. The shift towards the end of the Cold War officially began on November 9, 1989, when an East German spokesman mistakenly announced that the government would no longer prevent its citizens from leaving the country. Before long, vast crowds began to form on both sides of the Berlin Wall, and a wild party broke out, with people drinking, singing, celebrating, and fireworks as people took sledgehammers to the wall. Gorbachev refused to order a crackdown. The shift caught the confused East German authorities off guard, and so over the course of the next three days, they allowed some two million people to pass into West Berlin, where the West German authorities gave them $60 to spend however they liked. Easterners were shocked at the level of prosperity their fellow Germans had achieved, which only further undermined the legitimacy of the East German regime. Over the course of the next two years, communist regime after communist regime fell one after another. Despite the disintegration of Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union still held on for another two years. 
Not long after the wall fell, a coup occurred in Bulgaria, leading to the overthrow of the Communist Party. At the end of November, mass demonstrations toppled the communist regime in Czechoslovakia, and then the Romanian regime fell in December. The trend continued into 1990, when Lithuania declared independence from the Soviet Union, followed by Latvia in May and Ukraine in July. A dedicated communist, Gorbachev watched in horror as the forces his actions had unleashed enveloped his regime. In August 1991, hardliners in the Red Army launched an abortive coup, arresting Gorbachev and trapping the president of the Russian Republic, Boris Yeltsin, inside the Kremlin, which was then surrounded with tanks. By this point, the Reagan administration was no longer in office, having left after his two terms in January 1989. Reagan's successor was his vice president, George H.W. Bush, an establishment Republican moderate who had served in a wide range of political posts, including ambassador to the UN and China, as well as director of central intelligence. As Eastern Europe disintegrated, Bush adopted a policy of strategic silence whereby the U.S. would not actively encourage or discourage the events taking place. However, the August crisis prompted the Bush administration to reach out to the Soviet military and defuse the crisis. This resulted in a shift of power from Gorbachev to Yeltsin. And yet, to everyone's surprise, on December 25, 1991, the Soviet Union disintegrated into 15 separate states, the Communist Party was disbanded, and the Russian Republic declared independence. All of a sudden, the Soviet Union no longer existed. The post-Cold War era was marked by a different set of domestic and international challenges which the Bush and Clinton administrations were forced to navigate. Even prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, Saddam Hussein's regime in Iraq upset the Middle Eastern regional order when he ordered his troops to invade nearby Kuwait on August 2, 1990, taking over the tiny country in 48 hours. So why did Iraq invade Kuwait? Well, there's a couple reasons. First, at the end of the Iran-Iraq War, which lasted between 1980 and 1988, Iraq, unlike Iran, refused to demobilize and maintained an army of one million soldiers. This posed a threat to Kuwait, an independent territory that the monarchy, the Qasim regime, and the Ba'ath had all claimed at different points since the 1920s. Kuwait's only leverage to force Saddam to demobilize was the billions of dollars of interest-free loans that it had given Iraq during its war with Iran. So, when Kuwait called in those loans, Saddam was outraged. So far as he was concerned, Iraq had paid its debts in blood, fighting to keep Kuwait safe, and he had a point. Kuwait also knew that Iraq needed the price of oil to stay above a certain point in order to finance its own reconstruction and to maintain its enormous military, so the Kuwaitis and Saudis flooded the market with cheap oil and drove the price down. To make matters worse, the Iraqis realized that much of the excess oil Kuwait was putting on the market had come from a process known as slant drilling. In essence, the Kuwaitis were drilling at an angle under the border and stealing Iraqi oil. Saddam, quite understandably, was furious. Iraq's invasion of Kuwait prompted Bush to lay out his idealistic vision for a new world order, which called for a legalistic foreign policy that remained engaged internationally, believed in multilateral coalition building, and a commitment to international bodies like the UN. Keeping with this philosophy, Bush and his Secretary of State James Baker set about constructing a multinational coalition to liberate Kuwait and defend the Saudi regime, which the U.S. feared could be invaded next. After consulting with Congress, he ordered U.S. forces to deploy and defend Saudi Arabia in what was known as Operation Desert Shield. He then issued an ultimatum to Saddam Hussein to withdraw from Kuwait. On January 15, 1991, Bush ordered the U.S. military to eject Iraqi forces from Kuwait in what is known as Operation Desert Storm. The initial air assaults lasted for 38 days. In retaliation, Iraq fired 32 Scud missiles towards Tel Aviv and towards the Dahran Air Base in Saudi Arabia, where U.S. headquarters was situated. On February 24th, U.S. ground troops launched an invasion of Kuwait and discovered that the Iraqi army had withdrawn and set fire to some 700 Kuwaiti oil wells. Within 100 hours, the U.S. had cleared Kuwait of Iraqi troops. On February 28th, a ceasefire was declared. Despite the overwhelming public support for the Bush administration's approach to the Gulf War, the U.S. economy underwent a steep recession in 1991 as Reagan's 1986 tax cuts had, as predicted, resulted in budget deficits. Ever the pragmatist, Bush was forced to renege on his famous promise. Read my lips. No new taxes and raised taxes in 1990 in order to salvage the budget. The 1991-92 recession, when combined with reneging on his tax promise, meant that Bush faced an uphill battle in the 1992 presidential election, with political challenges on the right from tech billionaire Ross Perot and on the left from Democratic candidate Bill Clinton. With Bush and Perot splitting the right, Clinton handily won the contest, ushering the Democrats back into the White House for the first time in 12 years. 
Clinton's foreign policy was disastrous as the U.S. went from crisis to crisis with little clear sense of policy. With respect to Iraq and Iran, the Clinton administration adopted a policy known as dual containment, which sought to establish the U.S. as a regional policeman in the Gulf region, charged with containing the two pariah nations. The problem with dual containment, however, was that it made little practical sense. At the time, Iran was turning inward following the devastating Iran-Iraq war and was openly demobilizing, whereas Iraq had invaded Kuwait in 1990 and was expanding its military. Another problem was that the policy abandoned a decades-old policy of balancing Iran and Iraq against each other. So long as these two states were focused on each other, they would not be focused anywhere else. In short, the U.S. needlessly inserted itself into the politics of the Gulf and only found itself beholden to the oil-rich Saudis. The first major disaster the Clinton administration faced was in Somalia, which had previously been a Soviet client state and had disintegrated into a multitude of small territories that warlords controlled. Under the auspices of the UN, the Bush administration deployed 28,000 troops to Somalia to prevent a humanitarian disaster. Clinton drew down the deployment to a force of about 9,000. In mid-1993, the situation deteriorated as the most powerful warlord, General Mohammed Farah Adid, attacked UN peacekeepers, killing 28 soldiers. In response, US forces sought to take Adid out, but the mission went south, leading to the famous Black Hawk Down crisis in October, which saw 19 American soldiers killed in in a brutal night-long firefight. The next day, the bodies of dead American soldiers were dragged through the streets. Americans were horrified and shocked, prompting Clinton to cancel the deployment. The timing could not have been worse. In April 1994, a plane carrying the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi crashed under suspicious circumstances. Both presidents were from the Hutu majority, the dominant political class in both countries. Before long, radio programs began accusing members of the Tutsi minority of being behind the crash and called upon Hutus to slaughter the Tutsi cockroaches en masse. Over the course of the next 89 days, more than 800,000 Tutsis were murdered, often using machetes, while hundreds of thousands more were injured. The rivers leading into Lake Victoria literally turned red and were swollen with bloated corpses. The scale of, and speed of the genocide was more efficient than the Nazi death camps. The Clinton administration's response to the Rwandan genocide was abysmal. Fearful of another Somalia, Clinton ordered U.S. officials to avoid using the word genocide to describe the slaughter, lest it legally force the U.S. to take action. When the UN finally agreed to act, the White House further slowed down the deployment, haggling over minor details like the color that planes carrying humanitarian aid would be painted. This only delayed the arrival of UN troops and allowed more innocent Rwandans to be killed. Years later, Clinton apologized for his failure, saying that he was sorry for not, quote, calling the crimes by their rightful name, genocide. The Clinton administration also responded poorly to a humanitarian crisis engulfing the Balkans following the breakup of Yugoslavia. The Balkans are a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and religiously diverse region made up of Serbs, Croats, and Albanians. Initially, the dominant Serbs formed the Republic of Yugoslavia, but it disintegrated in April 1992 when Bosnia-Herzegovina declared independence, prompting Serbian forces to shell Sarajevo. Before long, Serbian forces began to ethnically cleanse the Muslim-majority territory, horrors that included massacres and the mass use of rape. Within a year, as many as 150,000 people had died and the UN was forced to intervene. Beginning in February 1994, NATO began carrying out limited airstrikes against Serbian forces, but the ethnic cleansing campaign continued. The crisis escalated in July 1995 when Serbian forces slaughtered 8,000 Muslims right in front of UN forces stationed in Srebrenica, who were unable to take action to prevent the massacre due to their limited rules of engagement. The Srebrenica massacre finally convinced the Clinton administration to take action to end the crisis. This involved backing Croatian forces who launched a successful offensive against Serbian positions while engaging in negotiations that led to the signing of the Dayton Accords in December 1995, which created two nations, a Serbian one and a Croat Muslim one, and brought the conflict to an end. In reality, it only bought time. In 1999, Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic ordered his military to engage in another round of ethnic cleansing, only this time aimed at the Muslim province of Kosovo. NATO imposed an oil embargo and demanded Milosevic 
of XC's all military activities. When he refused, Clinton ordered a widespread bombing campaign. This prompted another round of bloodletting as Serbian forces systematically burned entire towns to the ground while raping and slaughtering every Muslim they could find. Some 800,000 Muslims were forced to flee to the safety of neighboring countries. In June, Milosevic agreed to end the fighting, to allow Muslims to return, and to give Kosovo an increased degree of autonomy. Kosovo declared independence in 2008, and Milosevic was later convicted of crimes against humanity. The Clinton administration's failures in international affairs were only further compounded by domestic failures and scandals. However, Clinton's presidency was also marked with remarkable economic success. During the 1990s, the American economy underwent a remarkable transformation away from the industrial age and towards the technological or information age. The invention of the transistor and the microchip meant that computing technology that had once been confined to a large room could be confined to a desktop and then a laptop and then a smartphone. The World Wide Web, which the Department of Defense had designed as a means of rapidly sharing information, was made public and transformed the economy. Fledgling information technology companies like Microsoft and Apple that had struggled in the 1980s suddenly emerged as technological and economic powerhouses. Silicon Valley in California and Seattle suddenly emerged as tech hubs, and the number of new millionaires and billionaires abounded. Satellite technology suddenly allowed for the widespread use of cellular phones. The American economy boomed, but not evenly. For example, it was a big deal in 1991 when the Dow Jones Industrial Average passed 3,000. By 1999, it was beyond 11,000. Like the onset of the Industrial Revolution, the Information Revolution left many people behind, especially in the industrial heartlands of the Northeast and Midwest, now referred to as the Rust Belt. This is a process that continues to this day, as cities that adapted early to the onset of the information age have boomed, while others, like Detroit and Buffalo, have decayed. The Clinton administration also saw the rise of right-wing terrorism. In 1992, before Clinton came to office, a confrontation erupted in northern Idaho after a right-wing white supremacist named Randy Weaver refused to show up in court on weapons charges. Before long, federal authorities cornered Weaver and his family on Ruby Ridge, leading to an 11-day standoff that ended in a gun battle, which resulted in the death of his wife and son and a federal officer. He was later acquitted and five federal officers were suspended for misconduct. In 1993, another confrontation occurred in Waco, Texas, when a religious extremist named David Koresh, wanted for gun trafficking, holed himself up in a compound with a hundred heavily armed followers, including children. When officers from the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, or ATF, sought to apprehend Koresh, it resulted in a shootout that left four ATF officers dead and another 11-day standoff. On April 19th, federal agents tried to breach the compound when suddenly it erupted into flames. Koresh and his 71 followers, including 17 children, committed mass suicide. Ruby Ridge and Waco convinced right-wing radicals that the government was their enemy. As a result, throughout the early 1990s, right-wing militias began to flourish throughout the U.S., with followers deeply concerned that the government was planning to take away their guns. Watching the Waco crisis unfold from a nearby street, an angry young man with a shaved head ranted to a reporter that the government was overstepping its bounds. His name was Timothy McVeigh. Exactly two years later, on April 19, 1995, McVeigh drove a van packed with fertilizer, gasoline, and blasting caps outside a federal building in Oklahoma City. He then lit a five-minute fuse and left. When the bomb detonated, the blast destroyed the structure, killing 169 people, many of which were children at a daycare center located on the first floor of the building. It was payback for Waco. Eventually, McVeigh and his cousin, Bernie Nichols, were arrested and charged with carrying out this heinous crime. Americans were shocked that an angry white man had carried out the single greatest act of terrorism in American history, at least until 9-11. In 1996, Congress passed the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act in response to the Oklahoma City bombing. The right-wing reign of terror continued. A year later, at the Atlanta Summer Olympics, another white, right-wing terrorist detonated a bomb in a large crowd, leading to one death. In 1997-1998, an abortion office was bombed, then a lesbian bar, and then a reproductive clinic. Finally, in the late 1990s, on five different occasions, several assassins shot and killed abortion doctors using high-powered rifles. It seemed there was little the Clinton administration could do. When Clinton came to office, he shifted democratic policies rightward, promising to shrink the size of government and to reduce the deficit, even though Democrats had secured majorities in the House and Senate as well. Initially, this led to the passage of social programs that helped reduce the cost of education and the guaranteeing of 12 weeks of unpaid work leave for families. Unfortunately, he was unable to bring about the passage of a universal health insurance program. Liberals were further frustrated of Clinton's weak, quote, don't ask, don't tell policy with respect to homosexual 
homosexuals serving in the military. As a result, in 1994, dissatisfied voters returned the Republicans to the House, and for the remainder of his presidency, Congress was mired in political deadlock and scandal. The last half of Clinton's presidency was mired in scandal, particularly involving his sexual infidelity during his time in the White House. Essentially, Clinton had engaged in an extramarital affair with Monica Lewinsky, a young White House intern. When the story broke, the Republican-dominated Congress launched an investigation, prompting Clinton to deny the affair, saying, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Miss Lewinsky. But then backtracked and admitted inappropriate sexual contact. This is what got him in trouble. By denying the affair, Clinton had lied to Congress and tried to cover the affair up. In December 1998, the House filed articles of impeachment against Clinton and he was put in trial in the Democratic-controlled Senate. But in February 1999, the Senate voted to acquit the president.